So in this video, we will discuss problem number five. It's from the 2017 Calc BC exam, and it's a non-calculator free response question. Uh, this is the question in 2017 that was kind of a hybrid. It had some AB content as well as a little bit of BC only content within it. And if we get right into it here, uh, we have a function f defined by this rational expression. And so we've got a constant value of 3 in the top and then the quadratic polynomial in the bottom. And then in part a, it asks us to find the slope of the line tangent to the graph of this function at x equals 3. And, and this should hopefully be really, really straightforward. You want the slope of the tangent line to a function at a certain x. You need the derivative of that function and you need to evaluate it at the x where you want to find the slope of the tangent line. And so if you take the derivative, there are a couple different options that you have for taking the derivative. The, the option I went with right here was an application of the quotient rule, so derivative of the top, original denominator, minus the original numerator times the derivative of the function that's in the denominator, and that's all going to be over the original denominator squared. You want the slope of the tangent line at 3, so evaluate this derivative at 3, and it ends up giving you this. And, and in the non-calculator free response set, you can leave the answer looking like this if you do take a, a little bit of time to try to simplify it, which is risky to do on the actual AP exam. It's going to simplify to negative 15 fourths. Uh, but this answer right here is definitely perfectly acceptable. If we move into part B, part B is another part that only involves AB content. And it's asking you to find critical points of this function on the interval 1 to 2.5, not including either endpoint. So what has to kind of register here is that in order to identify critical points, you need to determine two things. You need to determine places where the derivative of the function is equal to 0 and places where the derivative is undefined. So critical points are, are points within the domain of the function at which the sign of the derivative of that function has the potential to change. And one of these two things has to happen before the sign of the derivative is going to be able to change. So to find where the derivative is equal to 0, well, this fraction is only ever going to equal 0. And I just took this right out of part A. Uh, but this fraction is only ever going to equal 0 whenever the numerator is equal to 0. So when you set that numerator equal to 0 and solve for x, you end up with 7 fourths. When is f prime of x undefined? So that's only going to be when the denominator is equal to 0. Uh, so when is the quantity that's being squared within that denominator equal to 0? Well, if you solve that by factoring, you get 5 halves and you get 1. Technically, although the derivative is undefined, those are not critical points. And I've listed the reason why in, in this little uh, bullet point right here. Those values are not in the domain of the function since the function is, is going to... It involves that same denominator, so the function is going to also be undefined at these two x's. So if, if we were concerned with a range of values outside of, of 1 to 2.5, uh, we would have to build a bigger sign chart than this. The, the derivative still has the potential to change signs at this x and this x, although they're not technically critical points because they're not included within the domain of the function. But when you're trying to wrap this up, do we have a relative min, a relative max, or neither at these x's? Well. If you pick a value between 1 and 7 fourths, which is 1.75, and you put it into the derivative here, uh, a number like 1.25 into this numerator plus 21 divided by something that's always squared is going to give you a, a positive value for the numerator. And divided by something that's always positive keeps the sign of the derivative positive. On the other hand, if you pick a value like 2, putting 2 here, negative 12 times 2, negative 24 plus 21, negative numerator divided by positive gives you a negative. That indicates we have a local max, but as they usually are going to ask you to do, justify that. Can't be with the sign chart. You just have to verbalize the, the logic that you're using to build that conclusion from the sign chart. So the, the concluding statement that I meant, that I made here to, to account for my justification was F prime is positive to the left of 7 fourths negative to the right of 7 fourths, therefore we have a local max at 7 fourths. It's not the only justification statement you can make, but you have to verbalize what that sign chart tells you. You can't just leave the sign chart to be your justification. Part C is where we start to get to the BC only portion of the problem. Uh, they say, hey, use this identity. 
Um, they've basically done a partial fraction decomposition with this expression for us, and they've decomposed this single fraction into the difference of these partial fractions. Normally, they would ask you to, to carry out that sequence on your own, so they were kind of nice in providing us with that relationship between the, the individual fraction we started with and the simpler fractions that it can be re-expressed as a difference by. Uh, then they say evaluate the integral from 5 to infinity or show that that integral diverges. Well, if you do the, if you were going to use FTC part 1, if you're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, you have to recognize that this is an improper integral. You'd have to trick the fundamental theorem of calculus into to working. You'd have to replace this upper limit of integration with uh, a dummy variable. You can use a. I did use a in my work a little further down the page here. But you check the limit as a approaches infinity of the definite integral from 5 to a of f of x with respect to x. That gives you the green light to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which means, hey, find your antiderivative. Toss in your limits of integration. Take a difference. What's your answer? So I, just to kind of make my notation a little easier to follow, I found the antiderivative on the left-hand portion of the screen right here. So each antiderivative is technically going to require a u substitution. The u substitution for the left-hand integral is a little bit more significant than the one for the right-hand one because you don't get any cancellation that happens. You don't pick any new factors up via the substitution sequence where you do have that happen over here. Uh, and so when, when you have that 2 in the numerator and you pick up this over 2 after substituting in for dx, you end up with those 2s canceling. You have 1 over u with respect to u, minus 1 over u with respect to u. Well, the u's are different, right? The, the first definition I had for u was that u is equal to 2x minus 5. Antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log of the absolute value of u. I've already back substituted here. And similarly, uh, I've back substituted in place of the u inside this set of absolute values with my other definition for u. I guess my notation could have been made a little bit better. I probably should have subscripted my u's, right? u1 down this column, u2 down that column. Just didn't think to do that before I was putting the video together here. Um, truthfully, I goofed what I'm about to explain next until I realized what part d asked me to do. And what I goofed with was I said, okay, well, if I just consider this from 5 up to a, and a approaches infinity, I'm going to get the natural log of infinity. Well, that is infinity. I'm going to get infinity for my answer. This integral diverges. What I was jumping the gun with, though, was the fact that I'm subtracting something off that's also infinite. Infinity minus infinity is an indeterminate form. I didn't catch that initially. I, I was doing part D and I, I realized that I must have made a mistake back in part C, so I was lucky enough to kind of backtrack and, and catch that and fix it up. But here's how you can re-express that difference as a single logarithm, right? You can use a property of logarithms. Rather than having a difference of two separate natural logs, we can re-express that as a single logarithm of a quotient of the first term of the difference and the second term of the difference. So property of logarithms applied there. We are still going to run into an indeterminate form here in a few seconds, but it's, it's not as difficult of an indeterminate form to address as that one I mentioned a few seconds ago, infinity minus infinity. So if we go to the limits of integration, and here's where I replace the upper limit with a dummy letter so that I can essentially trick the fundamental theorem of calculus into working here. I put a in place of my x's. I put 5 in place of my x's. I took a difference. And then I was checking the limit as A approached infinity. Well, when I put infinity there and infinity there, I do get infinity over infinity. Well, within that logarithm, the indeterminate form infinity over infinity isn't that big of an issue to address with L'Hopital's rule. Derivative of the top with respect to A is 2. Derivative of the bottom with respect to A is 1. So as we approach infinity, this expression within the logarithm is approaching positive 2. So what we end up with is we end up with the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 5 fourths, and, and that is what the integral is going to converge to. We don't end up with an infinite value here or a limit that doesn't exist. Therefore, the integral does not diverge. The integral is going to converge to this value right here. In part D, they asked us to say whether or not this series converges or diverges. State the conditions of the test used to determine the convergence or divergence. I looked at this part after I had made my mistake in part C, 
and, and I instantly thought for, for some reason I had just done the integral but I didn't think to use the integral test which you definitely can use I'm just so used to when I see a polynomial over a polynomial just instantly going to a comparison test and to use a comparison test you do need to make sure that the terms of your series are positive the terms of this series are positive for the values of the index the values of n that we're going to consider that gives me the green light to try to use a comparison test and when I used my comparison test I realized pretty obviously this term and this term in the denominator are dominated by 2n cubed, 2n squared, excuse me, once n bit gets pretty big. So when the value of n grows significantly, this series is going to behave like and compares closely to this rule right here. Same numerator and then the term that's dominating the denominator remaining with us within the denominator. Well, do you know anything about this series right here? Well, yeah, if I factor three halves out in front of, of this series across the same values of the index, 5 to infinity, I'm looking at three halves times a P series that converges. So since this is a convergent P series, what I can go ahead and do is use my limit comparison test, check the limit as n approaches infinity of the series that I started, the rule for the series I started with, divided by the rule for the series I'm comparing with. If this limit ends up being positive and finite, whatever my series that I'm comparing with does, the one that I'm looking for a conclusion about is going to do the same thing. And so if we change dividing by this series to multiplication by the reciprocal, we can cancel our threes. We do end up with infinity over infinity initially, but applying L'Hopital's rule a couple times gives you four over four, which is obviously just one. This limit is positive and finite. Therefore, whatever the series we're comparing with does, converges, our series also does. So our series is going to converge by the limit comparison test. Now I got this conclusion and I realized, well, hey, if, if the series with the rule converges, but the integral with the rule diverges, I must have done something wrong back here. And that was what allowed me to, to realize I was a little careless with just putting infinity and in, in five into this term and not also realizing that when I subtract off this term I'm dealing with infinity minus infinity in indeterminate form that I'm going to have to be a lot more delicate with than I was initially. So I was lucky to catch that mistake. Uh, the alternative method for part D is to use the integral test uh, since the series is positive since the terms of the series are decreasing, uh, and since this function is continuous for the values of n we're going to be considering, we can use the integral test as well to develop the conclusion that our series converges. Uh, probably a little easier to do that than what I did here, but, but I did part D correctly before I realized I made a mistake in part C, which is why I kind of have an alternative explanation here. But integral test works as well, as long as you state the conditions that have to be established in order to use it, which we just stated verbally here. And I do have those conditions stated for the limit comparison test, which would receive full credit on the exam as well. Interesting problem here. Be careful with Part C. Hopefully that has helped.